Well, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar for today, um, which is entitled, How, Will, How Well Are You Communicating with Donors? Um, I want to just take, with, uh, take the time before I introduce our really fabulous speaker today um, to talk a little bit about um, where how this is coming to you because we try to keep these sessions free for you um, because we want them to be available equally to all kinds of nonprofits but the only way we do that is through um, sponsorships and so I want to announce that today's sponsor is Network for Good um, whose online uh, giving platforms have powered more than one billion dollars in donations for a hundred thousand nonprofits. Um, you can find out more about Network for Good services, um, online fundraising solutions and free fundraising resources at networkforgood.com. Um, I want to remind people um, quickly that you have a question panel um, on, your, on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will, be, we will be ending the presentation portion of the webinar at um, around 140, 145, and at that point we'll, we'll be um, beginning to ask your questions of Tom. So as he's speaking, Pete, please feel free to log in any of your questions in that question panel. I'll keep track of them and, um, and pass them along to Tom. I do want to remind you all that um, one of the ways we make sure that everybody knows about these great free uh, resources is uh, by tweeting out the content during the sessions. And so you see on the right-hand side of this first screen, screen um, tweet with us um, and hashtag Tom on donor. So please feel free to tweet out all of the brilliant things that Tom is going to, to say to us today. Um, the other thing is we always get a million questions during the webinar. Will these slides be available later? <laughs> Um, we will um, send you out a webinar recording and the PowerPoint slides within 24 hours after we conclude this session. Um, so with that, I want to um, just say we're, again, Nonprofit Quarterly is really committed to ensuring that um, that nonprofits of all kinds get the information that they need to best um, serve their organizations and constituencies. Um, and you should always check out uh, both subscribing to our journal and um, our, our free daily newswire um, because those are things that will keep you up to date on all of the most recent trends. With that, I want to welcome Tom Ahern. Hello, Tom. Hey, Ruth, and hello, everyone. <laughs> well, let me just say for a second that um, Tom is fresh from an international conference on fundraising, um, so he has a lot of even recent bright ideas about um, communicating with donors. But he is a, a celebrated author, educator, and consultant on the topic of donor communications. and. Um, has very deep uh, knowledge of all kinds of obscure points. <laughs> so people should know when you ask him questions, um, you can ask him questions that really require a deep understanding of the research. He's going to be able, very likely, to answer them for you. Um, he's, a, he's very much a frontline kind of guy, but he's got a deep strategic streak in him. Um, and also a great sense of humor. So with that, Tom, uh, welcome, and I'm going to pass this over to you. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, I just want to add to uh, Ruth's uh, praise for Network for Good, although I don't get paid a thing to do this particular webinar. I know Network for Good, and I know how wonderful they really are. They have a strong, philanthropic, altruistic streak it's not just a company that's in the business to make money. 
So anyway, here we are, and you may wonder, this today is the self-audit. So let's look at another slide. There you go, the self-audit. And here's the first thing I, I will teach you about the dark arts. Why is there a puppy in that picture? Uh, because a puppy or a kitten in any picture is going to improve the, uh, the number of shares you get in social media. Uh, people love just sending these around to their friends. Oh, look at the cute puppy. This isn't my puppy. This is a puppy we, this is a borrowed puppy. This is a rental puppy that we threw into the picture in order to make me more uh, approachable and acceptable. So do the same thing in your pictures. Okay, so there's dark arts number one. Now, the uh, the one thing Ruth, she mentioned I'm front line. What, the, what that means in my view is uh, I am a trained commercially trained copywriter who then wandered in a door uh, into fundraising, uh, looked around appalled at what I saw, and started to gather more information as fast as I could about what actually works. And now, uh, you know, five books later, we have a much better sense of what actually works. And at some point, I... Um, I was you know, just thinking about how can I transfer this? After all, I can only work with X number of clients in a year. There are only so many people I can talk to. And can I give people a way to take it back to their office so they can self-audit their stuff? And so what you're going to get here today is a checklist of the least number of things I know that matter when you're trying to make more money and uh, or retain your donors longer. Uh, the biggest problem you will have, the one thing you will not see here is a remedy for an overbearing uh, boss or board chair, somebody who second guesses you, takes the, you know, puts their ignorance in the front of the line and uh, won't let you do what you learn here. Now, that's, that is a major problem. It uh, costs the charity industry millions, maybe tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Uh, people who do not know anything about communications uh, saying, well, we are going to do it this way. And that's that's your cross to bear, not mine. I don't have those. Let's, let's go forward here. Here's your first checkbox. And do you have do we, you're asking yourself these questions, do we have a case for support? And actually the word that is missing from there is do we even have a case for support? And what is that? Well, it is why should I, the answer to the big question, why should I give you my hard-earned money, stranger? And the first uh, question you have to answer, this is, uh, I want to give tribute to Martin Lundy who taught me these three big questions that are behind every good case for support. Uh, why us? What are we doing? That is so amazing that we must be kept alive and well. And, uh, you know, more <clears throat> nonprofits looked at this question, uh, ugh, frankly, fairly and objectively. They would maybe we'd have fewer nonprofits. I don't know. But the um, the question is, why us? What are we doing that's so unique? Here's an example. Why us? It's, this is the easy. What do these people do? Uh, well, they use, you know, some jargon like empower sexual health care, whatever. But you can see from the visual that they do things related to birth control. Always a good thing if you don't want to get pregnant. And so that's them, Bridger Care out in Montana. Uh, second question in the case for support. Where's the urgency? Why now? You know, I'm going to, as an average American donor, give to about 10 charities a year, and I'm going to have about 100 charities a year coming to my door and saying, will you help us too? And um, the sorting mechanism differs for each of us, but sometimes the sorting mechanism is, well, this is a problem that needs addressing right now. I can help versus that's a problem I can you know, not help with, and next year, you know, not much will have changed. So where's the urgency? Now, you're looking at a case for support for the Anchorage Museum, and where's the urgency up there? Well, wouldn't you know it, the ice caps are melting, and global 
uh, climate change is going to infect, uh, affect, probably infect, the entire planet. So we have a museum in Anchorage, used to be a uh, really, really nice, good regional museum. They want to go world class. They want to be the number one museum on the face of the earth that is telling the Arctic story the best. And they have a lot of reasons to think they can pull that off, including their association with the Smithsonian. So that's why now. Uh, and the final question is, why would I, your potential prospect, the donor, care about what you're doing? And let's look at a couple of things here to consider. Uh, why would I care? Well, one thing I learned from these people, the Compton Group over in the UK, and they published this book after they had completed a thousand successful capital campaigns. And one of the things, you don't have to read the book because you can read the thing on your screen. And it says, the key motivator for giving is not need, but opportunity. So what juicy opportunity are you putting in front of me? What's your offer? What's your proposition to me, the donor, that I would go, ha, huh, yes, I think that's a great idea. I want to be part of this. Uh, the other thing you need to know is who your donor actually is. Now, this is True Sense Marketing. They're a big national uh, direct mail firm. Um, they've got a, a star-studded cast of creatives and thinkers, and they also have uh, the Mount Everest of data. And what you're looking at is the average age of donors in the United States right now, today. And you'll see the biggest slice that's on the left, 46%, are people 65 and older. And the next biggest slice is 55 to 64. So between 55 and older, you've got about two-thirds of your donors. Notice the smallest slice is the 4%. Those are millennials. And um, the reason why, you know, the, the whole concept of we must have younger donors, let's get those millennials, it's based on two faults. Um, ideas. One is that donors stay with you forever, which they don't. Their average length of uh, stay is about seven years. And the other is that donors, um, I mean millennials, have money to give away, which again, they don't. They, they are building their lives. The reason why people are, donors tend to be in the older brackets is this. They are giving away their surplus income. They do not need it. If they give you 30 bucks, it's because 30 bucks will not change their lifestyle. If they give you 30 million, same thing. So the, uh, you, it takes a while for people that aren't born rich to accumulate assets and, and relative wealth. Middle class family um, may die in the US, and I think this is actually accurate, with an estate valued around a million dollars. But it took a lifetime to create that wealth. And you're, you, know, you get it at the end, not at the beginning. At the beginning, I have a lot of things to buy when I'm in my 20s and 30s and into my 40s. And if I have a family, it's houses, it's furniture. If I have kids, it's clothing, it's food, it's college. All the rest of these things are also competing for the, my, my, my wallet. And uh, you're just not going to have much of a chance with people who are very young. They are generous. That's not the point. The point is they need to age into their uh, chief giving years. And so how do you raise money for a millennial? You wait till they're 45. OK. Another question <clears throat> to ask yourself is, and this is the most basic question I have for you. If you don't pass this test, the rest of this is total waste of your time. Does your stuff pass the U test? So for instance, here's one that does. This is uh, Child Fund International, right at the top of the page. You're not just giving a bicycle. You're giving a dream. You know, oh, I can think about that. If I give you 100 bu a bucks, it buys one bike. Or I could buy you two bikes. Or I could buy people five bikes. There's five dreams. You can help make the, their dreams come true, these girls who are hoping for bicycles. It, so this passes the U test. The U test only matters in the big type. In the small type, nobody reads your small type. Uh, if you're not getting it, the word you into your headlines, it's just not, not doing a function for you. Now, I was working last year with Oxfam down in Australia, evaluating their stuff. And um, they had a letter, and the letter performed adequately, but you know, normally not without any excitement. Um, and I circled, as you can see, the red circles, 
uh, each instance where they used the word you. And they basically, they had quite a few, although right here at the opening, which is not a good thing, they had a you desert, and uh, the word you does not appear. That's not a great way to start a direct mail letter, but we'll put that aside. They have about, you know, whatever they have here, maybe 10, 12 instances of the word you. And then I showed them a letter I had written for my uh, big healthcare client, uh, Sharp, down in San Diego. And it had exactly, I was surprised to note, the same number of U's in it. Yet I knew my letter had performed amazingly well, brought in tons of new donors, and so really, you know, was kind of lapping their letter. And I thought, why is that? And then I realized, here's the reason. Um, the Oxfam Australia letter is about Bangladesh, even though the word you is in there all the time. It's basically just, you know, reporting on what Oxfam is doing out in the field. And it's, you know, kind of new. I can get the same news from other sources. It's about Bangladesh. It is not about me, the donor. Whereas the Sharp letter is exclusively about the donor, even though they both have the same number of views. And there are a couple of other things, of course. One is, as you can see, when they're side by side, my letter is was built for skimming on purpose. You have a lot of uh, single line paragraphs. You have a lot of white space framing those paragraphs, so that when I when the letter for Sharp says, "Now I come to you humbly to ask for your help," in turn, paragraph three, it is surrounded, framed by white space, giving it its proper resonance and its power, and you know, just saying, "Look at me, look at me." Whereas this thing from, from Oxfam, it's just this dense, impenetrable, the wrong type font, uh, and that would be the sans serif type font versus my serif type font, and why do I know that my serif type font, Titan's New Roman, is a better choice because of Colin Wielden's type, type uh, readability research, which showed that uh, in the US, the UK, Canada, and Australia, Serif type, like Times New Roman, in print is 400% easier for the brain to absorb quickly. This, the reason for that has to do with what is known as pattern recognition and what you actually train your brain on all your life. The deeper discussion, we don't need to get into it, read the research, or trust me, whatever, but that is what we know. Okay. So here's my point to you. You're not information vendors. In donor communications, you are emotion vendors. You're coming to me. You want me to feel good. <laughs> Maybe you don't care whether I feel good. Maybe all you see me as is a life support system for a purse. And if that is the case, which it seems to be for a lot of charities, then you won't have me long. Trust me on that. Um, okay, let's look at another thing in your checklist. Now, this is my checklist, too. This is just your checklist. This is my checklist. When I'm writing a case for support for a capital campaign for a billion dollars, as I am right now, or if I'm writing direct mail and I will know in, in three to four weeks whether I was an idiot or a genius, then I am paying close attention to my own checklist. And I'm looking for things like what are called mental nods. Mental nods is a concept developed by Siegfried Bergler in Munich in the 1980s when he was doing eye motion studies on people write, reading direct mail. And he noticed that sometimes, actually, they were physically nodding along with what they were reading. They agreed with what they were reading. And so you, you use this phenomenon. Um, they're also known as priming messages in uh, linguistic theory. It's like, you know, you get me thinking in the right direction. So here's an example. This is from a hospice conversion appeal. And, you know, you're, taking, you're going out to these people that give you gifts, one-time gifts in lieu of flowers because somebody they know died. And they, you, go, you come back to them. You have the authority figure on the envelope, the doctor. It doesn't matter, you know, a doctor, any doctor, please. Uh, for Catholic charity, you'd be a priest. Uh, and then you have a statement. If you believe in hospice as much as I do, and that's your mental nod moment. If, they're, if they are then thinking, yeah, I like hospice, hospice is a good thing, um, then, then this will, you know, they, there's a much better chance they will do the thing you tell them to do next, which is open immediately. So that mental nod is very important for separating 
the receiving world into two piles, the people that don't care, the people that might care. Here's the very same concept used on a vi completely different charity. That was hospice. This is the steel yard, which is an art center where people go and they learn to weld, they learn to produce jewelry, and they do molten glass. It's a great place. And we send out to that list, are you a steel yard true believer? And if they're mentally nodding yes, then open this. That's why we have loud red exclamation point language there. That's Cheap Tricks 101 in direct mail. Just always tell people what you want them to do next. All right, so there's that, mental nods. Let's look at, uh, are you surprising me or are you boring me? Here's a great uh, Roger Craver, one of the all-time most successful direct mail writers in America, um, wrote this as one of his teasers, Sue the Bastard. And, you know, he's working off emotional triggers like anger, perhaps fear, perhaps loss aversion. And it's just, you know, it's like, okay, you don't see that in the mail every day. And that's a good thing. Uh, what you do see in the mail every day is pretty much the same thing produced by a handful of agencies and it tends to start all looking alike. Uh, here you have this amazing uh, direct mail piece from uh, uh, Ontario Nature is the charity and the uh, creative people behind this is an agency called Agents of Good They're in Toronto. And uh, here's the outside envelope, the thing that comes in your mailbox. You see in the upper left two things. Most people guess correctly that they are bird feet. Most people do not, though, guess that they are ruby-throated hummingbird bird feet. And you go inside, and here you see up in the upper right, shot of taken of me just before we left Mexico. It's my good side. And uh, it is ruby. And she is writing the letter. Dear Jen, I bet you've never received a letter from a bird before. That's okay. I've never written one. And it goes on and it goes on. And it talks a little bit about the journey because they migrate every year and so forth. And there's even a map enclosed which shows their migration route. And it goes, uh, they, the most amazing thing to me from this map is they, they rest on offshore oil rigs. That must be a moment, huh, when three million ruby-throated hummingbirds descend on your oil rig. And then they go back up to uh, Canada and uh, for, the, for the summer, uh, home sweet home, et cetera. It's very charming. And here's the reply device. Yes, Ruby, I hear your chirp. I'll speak for you. And this was such a nice surprise that it tripled the response rate to the, this particular appeal in that part of the annual calendar of rotation of appeals. And um, one donor started a personal correspondence, a major donor, started a personal correspondence with Ruby, and now you're writing back and forth with a major donor. Kind of doesn't get much better than that. Okay, another way. Do we have too much happy face? Are we jumping the gun with the happy face part? So this is Plan International, and this goes back a couple of years, but they had me come in to audit their stuff, and uh, I took every image from their home page, and I put them together into one collage, and I said, what's the common element? And they said, Huh, everybody's smiling. Even the goat is smiling. And um, and that's true. Uh, and that's wrong and true. Because uh, what this is about is saying we do such good work that we have the happiest poor people on earth. And that is not factually accurate. Um, what donors need are problems to solve. So here's a different approach. This is Food for the Poor. Food for the Poor started as a small charity down in Florida, faith-based doing work, South America, Central America, and uh, originally it was food, now they're in all sorts of stuff, and the reason they can do that is they have grown and grown and grown and grown and grown, and they are now a $1 billion annual charity, and this is a typical page from their donor newsletter, and notice in the big type, the word you, the word you, their lives depend on you, without you, innocent lives are lost, etc. Your the, the thing is, here it is, if I don't have a problem to solve, I don't have anything to do as a donor. So don't rush to me with your PR photo saying, oh, look at how good our work is. Everybody's smiling. Start with negative imagery, and I'll have something to empathize with. And there's more science to that, but today we have to rush through things. Uh, do I treat my donors as family? Well, you should. Uh, because we're all in our lives looking for synthetic families to join. 
And, you know, you're born into a biological family, but then as life goes on and you have experiences and you do things, you meet people, and you have clubs and you have interests and you have hobbies and you have fascinations and obsessions, uh, these are all different synthetic families that you willingly join. And charity, a charity, a good charity can be a good synthetic family. It is a family of shared purpose, I feel. Trying to get something important done. All right, let's look at emotional triggers. Another uh, easily missed thing, if you didn't have the kind of training I have, where you learn that there are 7 to uh, 127 different emotional triggers that you can pull. Uh, here are the seven, well, I guess it's eight here. Um, and these are common. The only reason you see them on the screen is that they're ultra common. They are used all the time. In fact, when I'm starting to write, a piece for a client, I will sometimes just write these uh, these triggers down. They're arranged here alphabetically, not by potency, and um, and see where I can connect. And uh, the one what, that I rarely, if ever, go to is greed. Uh, I'm sorry, guilt. I just it just doesn't. I don't think people like to be guilted into things. I think it makes them flee faster down the road. So um, you know they're all there. Here's uh, an example of anger. This is uh, this is a uh, online ad. Probably uh, it appears, uh, pops up in in your window if you've shown any interest in animal welfare. That they they remarket so-called to you with things that you might also be interested in, like saving Angel, this albino dolphin, from a lifetime of hell. Any questions? Um, you know she was uh, picked up in a hunt. And her parents were killed, and this is a calf, so this is a baby. And she's in a small, ugly, dirty, filthy tank where people who are superstitious come by and go, oh, we worship you, you're going to make our lives better. And that seems unlikely given the hell she's in. But sign the petition to help free her, and in fact, she will be freed. So uh, here's the movement. Join the movement. Here are some of the ways. Your help, your donation helps us in the fight against modern day slavery. And you can, you know, the, what's good about this are the price points as well as the, you know, join the movement uh, language. You know, you've got very specific things that a certain amount of money covers. And it just makes it easier to imagine the outcome, the impact of my gift. Uh, with emotional triggers, you want to, uh, you know, you want to frack them. You want to, use them. I mean, when you just put a donate button on your web page, well, you know, what is that? That's nothing. That's an instruction. It's a hope, maybe at best. Um, it, it, it's not involving. You know. I need to feel something. So when you're looking at a, a rewritten donate button for the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights, um, and they, uh, they're being encouraged to add an emotional trigger to the donate button, because why do people come to their site? They come because they've read something in the paper, maybe about Black Lives Matter or something like that, and they're just angry. They want to do something about it. Uh, which brings us to getting them into a fight. Again, we, there's a reason why we want to get everybody into a fight. It's because we know why, uh, through Yale, uh, Dean Carlin's uh, research at Yale, why so many middle class households for the very first time in 2008 contributed to the Barack Obama campaign, and it's because they really had had it with the eight years of White House previous, and they wanted to, you know, get change, as you all recall, I'm sure, and uh, and they were willing to put 100 to 250 dollars into that, which was an unusually large amount for a middle class household in a presidential campaign. So get me into a fight. SPCA, get me, I will fight for animals. I will fight for cute things in distress, which covers anybody who has puppies, kittens, and kids. We have in biology something called the cuteness factor, which is these the various signals that emanate from young children or puppies and kittens out to adults. And those signals are built in by biology in order to say this creature still needs care, this creature is still vulnerable. And that's why raising money for homeless children sometimes can be way much easier than raising children, uh, money for homeless adults. Uh, are you, are we, is our organization by habit, by design, lushly grateful 
as the United Way of Pickens County is here in their most recent uh, gratitude report, not annual report, which is just a time designation, tray boring. Oh, a love letter to you, our donor and friend. Thank you for reading a love story. How do we love you? Let us count the ways. We love that you, we love that you, we love that you, we love that you, we love you. And if this embarrasses you, you can't imagine doing this, then why are you in fundraising? Come on. This is necessary. This is not optional. Here's uh, what Rory Green, Beth Ann Locke, two fundraisers at Simon Fraser University did during one lunch. They wrote loads of thank you letters to various people. Here's the Covenant House, and this is a uh, a personalized email sent to every donor. And so, hi Tracy, hi Tom, hi Steve, hi everyone. It's always got your name in the first screen. We wanted to thank you for stepping up and helping our kids. It may not seem like much. The kids struggling to survive. It's everything. Homeless youth are escaping abuse and neglect. They don't feel they feel safer on the street than they do at home. That's when you showed up. You took them in from the cold. You protected them from predators. You told them they were worth something. We have some statistics. All to the good. Feel proud of yourself, Tracy, because you did a great thing. And our kids can't do it without you. Thank you for believing in our kids. Absolutely the best way to raise more money. If you don't want to raise more money, if you're satisfied with your status quo, do not do things this way. Um, am I telling before and after stories? You have to tell stories, but oftentimes we hear this and think, oh, but I'm not a great storyteller. Yes, you are. All you have to do is before and after stories, because the before is where the donor enters your uh, family of purpose. The after is where the donor gets a big smile and goes, hmm, glad I went with these people. Look at all the good I'm doing in the world life. Now it's easy. Here's a little typical story. This is for a charter school. A poor child came in with mom. The kids in the second grade cannot spell well, failing in the classroom already. She's going to have a tough life if she doesn't get her education act together. And the parent, the teachers say, oh, honey, would you go up to the chalkboard and just write the word cat? And so the little girl goes up. I can see this in my head. K-A-T. Wrong. However, the uh, people at the school told me, at the end of the year, the same, very same child who was failing, uh, after a year of our voodoo, the pedagogy, they were trying to explain to me, uh, she could spell Tchaikovsky. And I have two degrees from a good university, and I had to look up how to spell Tchaikovsky in order to make the slide. So there's a third grader out spelling me with all my education. Uh, and it's all done in, you know, less than 30 seconds. That's how you want to tell your little stories. You know, here's, this is from Instagram. You've got, the, you've got the before. She came in. She lost her leg due to a birth defect. Now you've got the, the new prosthesis that donors have purchased for her, and it's getting fitted, and all, all of that is to the good. Can people skim the stuff I'm sending? Uh, somebody needs to mute their, uh, their phone out there in, uh, in uh, producer land. Um, skimming. So here's a letter. It worked. Uh, and look at what the opening is. Welcome dot 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 I hope. So you just failed 10th grade English. That's good because you should um, in order to write good direct mail. And you've given me something that goes into my head fast. Faster than that. Um, one of my many mentors, uh, Joseph Sugarman, said, how do you get somebody to read something? Well, you give them something short to read. <laughs> it's that easy. Welcome. I hope. Writing today to request the pleasure of your acquaintance. Blah, blah, blah. This place reserved for you. Blah, blah, blah. This is all highly skimmable stuff. Do I make lots of unburied offers? Uh, if you don't know what an offer is, there's no hope. Uh, here's an offer. Okay, This is Houston Grand Opera. And they were doing the thing that most charities do. So in a newsletter or some article, an e-news, whatever, uh, you have, you know, in bold type, uh, to purchase tickets, blah, 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 please call this person at this number. And, of course, that's what a buried offer is. The unburied offer is um, what you see it listed there at the bottom under improved. You can dance all night and help make Rudy's Offer Ball even more special. You turn it into a tiny ad. Offers have to be extremely visible at light speed and pop off the page. You want, for instance, 
if you're promoting bequest marketing, bequests, you know, charitable bequests, what is the number one reason people don't make charitable bequests? According to the research done by Fraser Green, it's because it, quote unquote, it never occurred to me. So you constantly remind them that, hey, you could do this. And you give them something easy to get the whole discussion started. And you never stop offering, as the Hampton Roads Community Foundation does here, a booklet, a free booklet, a new booklet, and yours for the asking. What this is called, the photo of the cover, is called an advertising the hero shot. You show me what you're going to give me. And, um, and that makes it a little more tangible. It makes it a little more desirable. And uh, people have been asking for this. And they uh, doubled the size of their legacy society in four years. So yes, it's working quite nicely. Thank you. Um, did you kill your jargon? I hope. Uh, here's jargon. You know, we saw this a little earlier in power. That's not a good word. You know, these words are dead on arrival, not because they're not intellectually understandable. They are. But they have no emotive content. You want to use another piece of jargon. They do not, they're not easily visualized. I mean, if you're a social worker and, and you know, you hang out with so-called at-risk kids all the time, uh, well, you know what they smell like and you know what they look like and uh, you know what they sound like and uh, so forth. But if you're an average person who does not come into uh, common encounters with at-risk kids, then it's just uh, jargon. It's just academic crap. doesn't make any, um, you know, you know it's, it's, a, it's a pebble without a pond. Um, here's another thing. Ask yourself, does my letter, if you're sending out an appeal letter of any kind, e or digital or print, does it shout, shout? It's SMIT, which stands for single most important thing I have to tell you today. And you know, you'll know you'll see direct mail appeals. I do all the time, because I do a lot of evaluations, where you know the letter gets going. And it's talking about the organization and the mission and the vision, how cool it is and how great the work and the programs and all, blah, blah, blah. And eventually, down near the end, it says, OK, you've been paying attention, I hope, and you've been listening to everything we've said about how great we are. So I hope you will now choose this moment to make your gift. That is not how you do it. That is the wrong way to do it, first of all, because we know that people don't read direct mail that way. Their eyes are all over the place like a butterfly. And, um, and so you can see here, this is, again, we don't study failure. We study success. Why did this succeed? Um, we, it succeeded because it asks either directly, I come to you to ask for your help, or indirectly, the cause for excellent health care needs you over and over and over and over. This is page one. This is page two. In two pages, I've asked you for a gift 16 times, and that is not my personal record, but this is an extremely effective direct mail piece. So uh, another thing totally must but must adopt this practice, the quickly delivering of the gift of joy. So here's the cover from uh, uh, Nashville Rescue Mission. And they uh, put there a big picture of somebody who's being helped by the mission. And this is the cover again. And there in the type on the cover, there's not a lot of type on the cover, so it's not smothered. You helped light Ryan's path. And there's always something like that on the cover. And the stopwatch is there to remind you that you need to get this into my head within seconds. Here's uh, another donor newsletter. What's here? Dear donor, Angelo has something he'd like to tell you. That's the first gift of joy. You saved us. That's the second gift of joy. And then it has a little in the deck here. It has a little bit about um, what the bad situation was. He needed emergency help. And help you did. There's your third gift of joy. OK, so we are now to that exciting part of this presentation where I am asked answers. And the question is, do I know how to solve your problem? And uh, you can subscribe to my free how-to newsletter. Just go to my website. And so questions. Anybody out there with questions? We have questions. Ruth, questions? Anybody? We do. We have a lot, and people um, should feel free to to um, keep um, logging them in. Thanks. But um, there's there were a couple of questions about what I'd call the invisible line of excess. Um, 
and particularly about um, in in you know, kind of what's called poverty porn or marginalizing the people that you're supposed to be helping in oh, your, oh. Um, yeah, right. in, in, Wait your, a minute, in your appeals. Do we have, I, can we get to real questions before we get into the nonsense? <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's a question. So people are asking. No, it's not um, a question, it's an attitude. It's an attitude, it's unsupported by research. And it's nonsense, and it just drags down income. So, I'd rather not spend time on that kind of, you know, junk. Um, don't. This is about fundraising today, not fund suppressing. And that's what poverty porn and that whole discussion is about. Is about fund suppressing. If you don't think that's true, ask Oxfam. We lost about forty percent of their income once they imposed uh, rules about. Uh, we cannot have pictures of sad things. And okay, so so another question is kind of in the same vein, and I hope that you won't reject this one. Also, is um, how much emotion is too much emotion in fundraising? Is there a line? No, there's no line. I got to tell you, I, I you know, unlike probably most of you, I see thousands of pieces of nonprofit communication. So I can see as a class what your work actually looks like. And your work is, you know, it isn't even close to a line. Why are you second guessing when you, you know, basically you're saying no before you've even said yes. I can promise you whatever you're doing, it is not anywhere near excessive. It is timid. It is safe. It is committee driven. It is pre-approved by people who do not know anything about persuasion or psychology. And it, it's it, if it is working at all, it is because you have so much low-hanging fruit, like you're dealing with kids, that you're raising money despite your communications. Okay, and another kind of more um, more specific question is in the before and after scenario that you presented was there any reason why the um, the after shows before the before um, in other words the after was in the left hand um, the the left hand pane and the before was in the right hand pane yeah I don't know just the way they you do don't it. Know. <laughs> no. I mean, basically, if you looked at that from a, well, let's look at it scientifically from an eye motion standpoint, you're going to look at the, the, the picture first. And you're going to look at, if you look at, which is unlikely, you're going to read the word second. So, you know, it, it, it's not the greatest example probably of before and after, but it, it was fairly tidy. You know, it was fast. The picture told the summary. Now, in appeals, you show the sad stuff. In newsletters, you show the happier stuff. So although I must say Food for the Poor mixes that up considerably, and they show a lot of sad stuff in their newsletters too. But you don't, you cannot just be talking about the negatives all the time because uh, then there's no, you know, there's no hope, there's no promise. You really haven't, you know, done anything to improve the situation, or the donor hasn't done anything to improve the situation. So uh, you do have to, there are smiley faces at some point, don't get me wrong. It's just that too often charities start with a smiley and they, you know, they really, they've lost me. I've got so many other causes, I've so many problems in the world. I mean, just check today's paper. Um, and there are many things that need doing. And uh, if you're bringing to me good news before you're bringing to me bad news, uh, then you're not, you're not one of those things that needs fixing. Okay, Boyd, there are some really incredible questions here, so I'm going to have to pick and choose a little bit. Um, would it be okay to highlight a deceased donor in a, an appeal? Yes. Yeah, and I can, um, for instance, uh, one of the great uh, series of ads being done by the uh, Hampton Roads Community Foundation, which I noted earlier when I showed their, the cover for their uh, request marketing brochure, 
is uh, they have a series of ads which uses a headline that goes something like this. I'm sorry, I don't have it verbatim. You go to their website, you'll see one. Uh, it's, it will have a picture of somebody who is dead. Um, and often you can, you know, it looks like they're somebody from the 1950s or 70s or something like that because of their clothing, hairstyle, and so on. And uh, it'll say, um, uh, Ruth, um, I don't want to step on your grave there, Ruth. Uh, Ruth Smith's, <laughs> yeah, right. Ruth Smith's will says a lot about her. What could your will say about you, right? So it's a, it's a nice, tight headline with a question mark. Question marks are useful in headlines to get people kind of more, a little bit more involved. They want to, you know, give it a little more thought. And uh, when you read the uh, the little body copy, the small amount of body copy that's next to the photo of this Ruth Smith. It'll say, uh, Ruth Smith was a teacher all her life. Uh, she didn't, um, you know, she was, a, she was a good, upstanding member of the community, always voted, and had a real passion for um, violin, you know, or something like that. She left a gift in her will to support the Virginia Symphony Orchestra so they could always bring in young musicians and, and help them get their career started. You can do something like that in your will, too. Thank you. That's how you do it. You know? So the, what, what the picture of the dead person is, it's not about the dead part, because that doesn't matter. Um, what, well, it does to getting the bequest. But as Richard Radcliffe says, uh, bequests are life-driven, death-activated. Uh, what it's about is what R Ruth Smith cared about and what she was willing to share uh, out through her will with the community. And what might you want to do in that same vein? I mean, I think a lot of people assume that bequests come from rich folk, and they don't. They mostly come from middle class estates, and they actually mostly come from middle class estates without heirs. So if people, like a married couple has no children, or somebody's single and they don't have kids, they are very, very, very good candidates for a charitable bequest. They just mostly never occurs to them to do such a thing, but uh, you can be the the charity that uh, kind of closes that gap. Yes. Next question. Oh, yeah. Um, one question is, what do you suggest for a cause that doesn't have such a visible problem and solution? My or organization is about preventing cancer, not curing it. So we don't have patients and survivors to use. Uh, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Why, why cancer is not enough of a problem? We need something even bigger. It seems to me that you've got a significant problem there. And uh, how, whatever your solution is, because it's not preventing cancer, now we have this incredible program that we want to do, requires donors, and uh, assuming it does require donors, of course. And um, you, you're, you're set to go. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't quite get this. Sometimes there's a lack of a, you know, people just aren't beating their head against it. Not, th th there's no easy solutions to communications. It requires you to, to spend a lot of time with drops of blood running down your face, coming up with bad ideas until you come up with a good idea. I don't have an instant solution for that, but if there is one, you've got a huge problem you're trying to prevent. Great. Um, there is one question here, which is, are there any really bad times of the year to do direct mail? <laughs> yeah, the summer tends to be in the United States. I mean, the summer in uh, Australia is different, I think. Maybe not. I take that back. Um, I don't know. They, they walk on their heads down there. It's a little hard to figure out. The, um, the summer in, in America is when we you know, eat, overconsume, get sunburned, eat hot dogs, ice cream, run around, and pay no attention to anything. Even that said, it's a good time, maybe, if nobody else is mailing, to be making appeals. Now, the uh, a standard schedule of appeals would and and newsletters because appeals don't act in isolation; they act in co in coordination with. Um, two other things, thank yous and reporting. So the basic uh, cycle of life in donor communications is um, you ask for my help, then you thank me for my help, and then you report to me what you did with my help. So those three things have to happen. If they don't happen, 
if you're weak on the thank you and the reporting, you're going to lose your donors way faster than you already are losing your donors, which is pretty fast. Because in the United States, uh, we lose eight out of ten first-time donors within a year, and that is a disgraceful, uh, you know, record that reflects the um, the the poverty. If you want to talk about poverty porn? The poverty of the materials that we send out to our donors, the the <laughs> lack of emotion that is that is in those, uh, the lack of emotional gratification that is in those materials. Uh, the people with the best thank you program win. The people with the best thank you in a newsletter program win even bigger. And uh, so if you're paying no attention to that, you're just hoping checks come in the mail, well, you've got one third of it right and two thirds wrong. So how's that going to work? Um, so one uh, another question here, and this is, I think, an interesting question: is uh, what are your thoughts about using data charts and infographic kinds of things in what you send out? Well, it takes time. Just don't, you know, uh, is it is it compelling? Not particularly. Uh, can it be interesting? Yeah, sometimes. Um, the uh, you, you build success in communications backwards from your don from your target audience. So if your target audience uh, is a grant funder, for instance, they require um, data. They probably don't require infographics. Um, they just need to you know your your statistics. Uh, are you making progress on this problem? Blah blah blah. Uh, but individual donors don't actually care all that much about your data. In fact, some good research done by Dan Ariely down at Duke that showed that if you, uh, you know, told stories exclusively, you got, a, you know, a certain amount of income coming in. And then if you told, use statistical data, same evidence. I mean, basically saying the same thing. The impact was this, but it's just in numbers. Your your giving was cut in by more than half because you had gone to statistics instead of stories. And, and the third part of his research, which was truly uh, eye-opening, was that when you mix statistics in with storytelling, the statistics actually dampened the impulse to give. And so your giving did not, it rose a little bit over statistics alone, but not by all that much. So statistics are very problematic in uh, reporting to individual donors. Now, infographics, kind of another flavor of the month. Let's do it cute and pretty and have cartoon characters and all the rest of it. And it can be, it can be fun. Uh, what I see tend to be kind of cluttered, not all that much fun. They're kind of interesting, but maybe you know, it's, just, it's, it's not as easy as as one might think, to come up with something that truly checks all the right boxes with an infographic. So uh, it's not like I spend a lot of time thinking about them, frankly, because they're not going to be all that useful to me raising money. You know, there's um, there's one here that's been asked um, any number of times in different ways, and I'm going to ask that as our you know, final question. I think that this will take us almost to the end of our time. But um, what are the connections between the various platforms, and are there any rules um, or or uh, research that people should be aware of about which platforms, for instance, direct mail, online fundraising, etc., to use with which groups of people? Uh huh. Yeah, there's a lot of research. In fact, if I if I could recommend one thing immediately, it's to somehow find the research just done by Amy Eisenstein and Adrian Sargent. It's available free online, and it has to do with major gifts. And that's about all I can tell you. So if you Google all that, you should find it. And uh, Ruth, if if that's not the case, maybe in uh, nonprofit quarterly you could highlight that research or something. Mm -hmm. it, it's valuable. It took my head and spun it 180 degrees because you know it, when you're starting up a charity, uh, 
that is a big question. How are we going to sustain this? You know, maybe we got a grant for two or three years from a foundation, then they're going to drop us like a, you know, a cold I mean, it, it, potato, and and we're going to supposed to be on our own. So a lot of times, I guess that's how we get into the events business, which is a kind of a for most people a, a kind of a second-rate way to get by with fundraising because it doesn't really build. What you need built, which is a strong, uh, you know, synthetic family. Uh, you only see them once a year, a couple of times to exhaust the staff. You know, not a great ROI, return on investment. And uh, what is a great return on investment? Well, major gifts is a great return on investment. And what major gifts is about is going out and finding a few people who will supply you with the uh, about eighty to ninety percent of your the charitable income you need in order to sustain and grow your mission, and uh, so it, you know, does it? Is it a, an instant? Um, no, no. It takes a couple of years probably to put it together. Uh, you, you, you're going to have to invest before you earn, and you know that's one of the things charities do for us. They don't invest. They they they're so afraid. For instance, of the charity watchdogs like Charity Navigator and so forth. That they they won't invest uh, in decent salaries. They won't put money into marketing efforts. The the uh, bequest marketing effort that was done by the uh, Hampton Roads Community Foundation uh, started with a hundred thousand dollars being voted by the board to be put into uh, buying advertising and so forth. And and they had no guarantee of results. And some of that advertising worked better than other kinds. And um, and yet here we are. Uh, they've doubled the size in four years of their legacy society, and they're and uh, you know their average gift coming in is a million dollars. So that hundred thousand dollar in uh, investment initially probably turned a lot of people white, but you know <laughs> white in the sense of drained of blood. And uh, they uh, yet it paid off, and things do pay off. I mean Facebook. You can raise money for certain kinds of, uh, you know, charities like animal welfare, particularly on Facebook, but you can't unless you start buying Facebook advertising, which means there is an outlay, and um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, go look at the major gifts research, find out some more. You, you know, it's, uh, you're gonna. I think you're gonna be surprised by it because it was. Here's the here's the kicker. They um, they did it to see whether small shops, not big shops, small shops, small NGOs, could do successfully major gifts fundraising, and they found that yeah, you could, and many times yeah, you should, rather than starting with direct mail or something like that. Great, thank you, Tom. You have no idea how many more questions we had. Um, if people who are interested in more workshops in this vein, webinars in this vein, please let us know on the question section here what are the questions that you want to have answered in, um, in future sessions. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Tom. This has been incredibly useful. Um, and I'm hoping we can have you back at some point. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you, audience. I appreciate having your ears, and uh, good luck with everything. Okay. Bye. Bye now. Thank mm -hmm. you.